So first of all, I wanna thank you all for your hard work throughout the pandemic. You all have felt the impact of this COVID uh, period saga, uh, personally, as well as in uh, your pers professional life and, and especially in the grant work. And I so appreciate the thoughtfulness and persistence you've had in making sure that you conduct high quality research. I also want to thank the meeting co-chairs, Brian Boyd and Dory LaFarette, for the work that they have done in planning this meeting and addressing our theme, advancing equity and inclusion in the education sciences. They have committed their time and effort in putting together thoughtful and engaging sessions, and we are grateful for their insights. So my plan today is to do a little bit of setting the stage, then reviewing NICSER funding and competitions, talk about our plans for the IES 20th anniversary and provide some recent activities in IES and NICSER that are relevant to our research. So to date, NICSER has invested just short of $1 billion and funded over 530 grants in early intervention and special education. In addition, we have funded 79 postdoctoral trainees and provided early career development and mentoring grants to 33 scholars. We have also trained hundreds in our methods training, including single case design and adaptive interventions and smart designs. I'm very excited this year to show our Nixer team. Uh, Nixer has eight staff, excluding me, three new program officers. Two of these, Akila Nelson and Emily Weaver, have been with us since last summer. And um, we were able to hire um, Britta Brasina for two years to help us with our pandemic recovery work, and she's just starting. Bennett Lunn is a Truman Albright fellow that splits his time between Nixer and NCER and will be with us until he starts law school in late summer. This is an awesome team and they have risen to every challenges that have faced them this year through the pandemic, tight budgets, et cetera. It's, it's really an, an honor to, to work with them. So I've been showing this slide during presentations recently because it's one of many reminders of the need for research on children and youth with disabilities. It shows the percentage of students that perform below NAEP basic on reading, math, and science in grade 12. There are substantial numbers of Asians, Black, Hispanic, and white students at this level, but the green bars representing students with disabilities are the worst. 67 score below NAEP basic in reading, 82% in math, and 75% in science. And this is before the pandemic. So this speaks loudly to the work that we do, and there are certainly many other examples in the social, behavioral, mental health arena, as well as in the research that supports educators and families of children with disabilities. Um, but again, it's a, just a reminder that you know, research is needed and, um, and lots of it. This on the next slide are my typical funding slides. We do not have our appropriation for fiscal year 2022 yet, uh, maybe we will by the time this goes live, but I, I suspect not. Um, and we are currently operating under a, a, another continuing resolution, which goes through mid-February. We have seen slight upticks in the amount appropri appropriated over the last few years, but we have not uh, returned to our original appropriation. This slide shows the dollars that we have left for new awards once we pay out our continuation costs for grants that we have committed to for several years and other expenses such as peer review. In the last couple of years, we've been able to compete our main competitions as well as other competitions, including training and systematic replication. So let me talk about uh, fiscal year 21. So uh, we had a great year. We, we awarded 36 grants for an investment of $78 million. 22 special education research grants were awarded in our main research program, 324A. We funded seven early career uh, training grants uh, to um, early career scholars. We funded um, four replication grants. And um, uh, in the last two years, there have been eight replication grants funded, excuse me, there have been 10 replication grants funded across IES 
and eight of them were in Mixer. So it, it uh, really uh, uh, speaks to uh, the, the rightness of our efficacy work uh, to go into the replication mode. Um, so uh, you all uh, should be uh, pleased uh, about the progress that we are making as a field. Um, and then um, we funded uh, two grants for our NAEP process data competition, uh, which is uh, again, uh, uh, is sort of in the data science, it is in the data science realm, so that's exciting. And then we funded an unsolicited grant, which is gonna help us with dissemination. Uh, the idea of the, the grant is to uh, do video broadcasts of our um, research in, uh, across various networks in the US. And many of you contributed to this project and, and uh, we're grateful and the results are, are really, really cool. So because we've been so successful in the last couple of years, that means that um, we, um, uh, we funded a lot and um, uh, we could not in uh, fiscal year 21 fund all the way down our slate to fund all of those that were rated outstanding and excellent. So we had four that were um, rated outstanding or excellent that could not be funded. So uh, given how successful we've been in the last couple of years uh, and the lack of continuation money that uh, could roll over, um, it, this means that we were unable to run regular competitions in F FY 2022. I know you all know that, but I thought I would go through it systematically. Um, Director Schneider and I are concerned about this, obviously. Um, we know that NICSER funding helps to sustain the infrastructure for research in early intervention and special education. And we also feel that the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on individuals with disabilities um, is great and the timing could not have been worse. However, um, we um, have been able to take advantage of um, the um, American Rescue Plan research initiatives uh, that IES has been able to undertake. IES was awarded um, 100 million in the American Rescue Plan. And um, uh, uh, NICSER has, is, a, is uh, funding some impo important work as a result of this. Uh, thus far, we have two initiatives underway and a third um, that I am hoping to give you more info during the live Q&A, but I can talk a little bit more about it. Um, it is, um, uh, it's, it's two challenges um, or prizes, um, as, uh, as uh, we often call them in IES. And one is to innovate in, um, uh, in math science instruction. And the second is to improve math achievement for elementary uh, school students with disabilities. So the first one is broader. The math science one is broader. It's not just for students with disabilities, although it allows for uh, uh, subgroups of students with disabilities, but the second one focuses on uh, math achievement for elementary students with disabilities. So I'm sure you're all aware of um, the pandemic recovery research competition, so I'll just talk about the status. By the time you're viewing this presentation, the award will be made for the first deadline, the targeted projects with the most urgent need uh, to get up and running. Um, applications for the second deadline are in peer review with panel meetings scheduled for late February and early March. So the Artificial Intelligence Institute is a collaboration with the National Science Foundation. And it takes advantage of the technology and artificial ex uh, intelligence expertise that NSF has developed, along with the grounding in education and um, the um, knowledge of special education that uh, Nixer and our grantees bring to the table. So um, for this competition, we um, are currently focused broadly in terms of the issue addressed, the population focus and the setting. And um, there was a webinar about it um, that was held in November and preliminary proposals. Um, they are due from my perspective pre-recording, but they were due uh, January 14th. Uh, uh, 2022. So by the time you see this, they will have already uh, passed. And we were really appreciative of the kind of expertise uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, has been um, shown interest in this. All right, while we're on the pandemic, um, I thought I would just talk a little bit about 
uh, how we've addressed the pandemic uh, for IES researchers. So um, we've extended budget periods for projects whose work had to slow or pause. We have offered supplements where possible, and I, it's it's really um, uh, um, you know money was very tight, but we did offer some supplements. We could offer some supplements there, um, and uh, we worked with you in thinking about your research plans. And um, it, this has been a great collaboration, and we really appreciate um, all of you keeping your program officers in the loop and talking um, very realistically about what's possible and what um, you, you are able to do in your work. So um, some of the things that we've talked to you about, including changes to your sampling, assessments that you've done, uh, data collection and analysis. So um, going forward, uh, you know, we still have a long way to go. Everybody thought we were through it and here we are again. Um, so, you know, continue work with your program officer. They're your best link. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, they're, they're, as you know, the team is very committed to working with you. Um, and we want to do as much as possible um, um, to have you continue uh, the work that you're doing to support meeting your research objectives. And our goal is to continue to focus on high quality work that contributes to the field. And that's, that's our bottom line. 2022, it marks the 20th anniversary of IES. Now, Nixer's a little younger. We're four years younger because we didn't join until 2006. So we'll certainly have celebrations then, but um, you know, we're always up for a party. So um, we're, we're, um, we're happy to be part of the, the uh, 20th anniversary of all of IES. So there will be events and activities throughout 2022. Obviously, NCER and NICSER will be looking to highlight IES research and our researchers. Um, and in addition, we have also funded activities to help us take stock because you know an anniversary is always time to think about what you've done and what you could be doing better. And we have a couple things that are in the works um, that uh, are helping us do that. One such, such activity that uh, I mentioned in my correspondence with you last year is a review that um, IES um, has asked NASA, uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine to do that's focused on the research centers. This, specifically, uh, they were asked to identify the critical problems or issues for which research is needed new methods or approaches for conducting this research that should be encouraged and why, and new and different types of research training investments that are needed. To help us take what is learned by the National Academy report and look forward, they've been on a quicker timeline than they usually are. Um, and uh, we should, the report should be uh, released sometime um, in early February-ish. Um, so um, you can look forward to seeing that. And, and I wanna um, thank those of you who have served on the panel um, itself, uh, representing um, special education and early intervention, and also those who agreed to uh, come before the panel and talk about the work that you do and that, uh, um, that uh, you, you um, uh, things you like about um, IES and NICSER and things that uh, have been a challenge and you want to see improved. So another project that will help us focus on future activities is a grant to Larry Hedges and Beth Tipton at Northwestern uh, as an unsolicited grant. It's uh, a project that's focusing on randomized trials that we've conducted over the last 20 years um, um, to either test efficacy or effectiveness. And what they're looking at is not just seeing whether or not we found positive effects, but whether or not these um, RCTs have made a direct or indirect con contribution to practice, whether they've affected fundamental knowledge and understanding of education, whether um, they have trained researchers focused on the education uh, in the education sciences, and, um, and whether that's made a difference in the field and, uh, and um, their impact on methodology. So the team has spoken to many of you already, and I know that many of you have served on their advisory board and I, we appreciate that, but we ask those of you 
who have not opened their email or who have not responded to them to please do so. Um, so the, the sample is um, three quarters uh, of the projects are um, NCERs and a quarter are NICSERs just because of the, the, uh, the difference in our size. So um, we really hope that um, uh, we have a good response rate for our projects and uh, that you share with them some of the, the challenges and the, and the uh, victories that you've had in doing your research. So now I'd like to spend some time going over recent activities that have been going on in IES. So the first is SEER resources and um, what works clearinghouse updates. So in terms of the SEER principles, we have continued to work on technical assistance documents to support the implementation of the SEER principles. We knew when we adopted them that we would need um, time and that things would evolve in terms, about, uh, in terms of us meeting um, uh, the, um, the goal of implementing uh, well uh, what the CR principles stand for. Um, so uh, this year, um, there are three new guides for researchers who um, are interested in um, uh, uh, reviewing them to incorporate them into their own research. And these guides focus on enhancing generalizability of impact studies, use, using a Bayesian framework and spreadsheet tool to interpret findings from impact evaluations and to report data and findings. Uh, the folks that worked on these uh, guides are going to be uh, with us at the PI meeting. Their session is Thursday, January 27th at 1130 Eastern. Um, so if you're interested, curious, uh, please join them. The other thing I wanted to just mention, I got an offer from Matt Soldner, the commissioner for NCEE, who oversaw the, um, the um, development of these guides, uh, is that the contractor has some um, availability to uh, discuss these guides uh, for training purposes. So if you are um, working with young scholars or uh, folks in your university or organization are interested in having people come and talk about these guides, reach out to me and I will pass that on and we will hopefully get something set up. All right, uh, I wanna talk about practice guides for just a couple minutes. So the math practice guide was released in 2021. I hope you've all seen it. Um, so, for example, they're coding uh, the components of interventions and looking at them. So um, the objective is helping us identify instructional practices that alone or in combination make a difference in math learning. So stay tuned for, for that. I, I, we're excited about it and hope that it means that we can mine the data from future practice guides um, in additional ways. Okay, in terms of um, upcoming practice guides, um, there is one on providing reading interventions for students in grades four through nine. Um, this will be released in early spring and Sharon Vaughn uh, has been the chair of that panel. And then uh, there are multiple guides that are going to uh, come out focused on behavior interventions and supports in the context of multi-tier systems of support in the elementary grades still uh, in progress, and so stay tuned uh, for, for further um, um, word on that. Okay, I also want to talk about um, the planned release for the What Works Clearinghouse's uh, 5.0 version of the Procedures and Standards Hair Handbook, um, which is going to be released for public comment in uh, February of 2022. In this version, uh, the changes will include some simplifications to group design standards, changes to the single case design standards and revisions to how the WWC characterizes rating of research quality and evidence of favorable effects. Please take advantage of this opportunity for public comment, um, especially those who are interested in progress on single case design standards. Um, special education researchers will perhaps be the only commenters on single case design. So it's important um, that, that we do that. Um, and we want to make sure that we keep, keep up the dialogue between um, single case design researchers and uh, the What Works Clearinghouse. Also expected out of the What Works Clearinghouse are intervention reports 
that will include syntheses of single case design and group design standards. And um, one of them is the good behavior game. And the first of these will come out in early fall uh, 2022. This is incredible news for those of us who have been concerned about evidence of in areas where much of the work has been done in, um, using single case design. Um, uh, so, um, you know, this is, this is uh, something to watch for and, uh, and celebrate. Um, I also wanted to note that um, earlier this year, the What Works Clearinghouse released a new version of the WWC reporting guide for study authors to help research teams think, think about um, various components of their work and reporting. Um, so if you're interested, uh, check that out. All right, in, in line with the theme of our meeting, I wanted to talk to you about IEX activities um, and provide some data uh, related to uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. So uh, December of last year, IES held a twig on uh, diversity. And uh, the summary of the discussion is up on our website and includes five broad areas of recommendation, including the need to identify key gaps and barriers, uh, develop an action plan, revise existing and develop new funding opportunities, attend to the research uh, pipeline or ecosystem, if you will, and engage in our targeted outreach. We have a diversity group composed of staff from each of the two research centers, as well as the IES Office of, of Science, which uh, helps with the peer review um, and helping us to work through some of the issues and to uh, address uh, these five areas. Uh, Liz Albro and I recently released a, a blog on progress. We actually have limited data uh, as a baseline for us uh, to think about uh, how we're going to monitor progress uh, for, for um, our work in this area. Um, and one of the areas we have is uh, the applications uh, from MSIs and who we fund. So I, I wanted to uh, provide uh, at least that history uh, for us. Um, so specifically, applications received from MSIs between 2013 and 2020 uh, were 4% 4, 4 of applications to NCER and 1% to NICSER. And of those applications that were funded, 10% of um, NCER's awards were made to MSIs and none of NICSER's award were made to, to MSIs. So we have a lot of work to do to increase apps in this area, but it's um, always good to have a uh, baseline uh, uh, work uh, for going forward. If you submitted an application for our uh, fiscal year 21 competitions, I'm sure you've noticed that there is a required form titled R&R personnel data. Uh, sorry, not personnel, personal data. After sol solving the technical challenge of ensuring that the personal data was not going to be stored in the same place where your grant application was um, uh, and not included as part of peer review, um, we are able to move forward to collecting this data. So just to be clear, it's separate and, and it, it doesn't go the same place that your application goes. Um, so uh, we started collecting this data. Um, and as this is a voluntary disclosure, all co-PIs and PIs were given the option to respond with information about their personal characteristics. Um, the data on this table reflect information only um, about the PIs um, and are combined across NCER and NICSER uh, for, for all competitions for fiscal year 2021. This data provides us with a place to begin as we work together um, to uh, address diversity of who is applying and receiving funding from IES. Um, uh, the response rates uh, range from 70 to 80%. So even though everyone has to go through the form, excuse me, they're not all required, uh, they're not required to answer all those questions. That's obviously a personal uh, decision of whether you want to leave something blank or not. Um, so the response rates per items are ranged from 70 to 80, uh, 82%. Um, and obviously, you know, you can see our applicants are predominantly white, non-Hispanic, and do not have a disability. Um, and we certainly have room to improve. And um, the more information we have, the better uh, our response rates were and the better we um, know how we're doing along these lines. So the lowest response rate was for people to disclose whether or not they had a, a disability that was 70%. 
So, you know, as you all know, that's a challenge in, um, in the work that we do and apparently in, the, in those conducting uh, and filling out forms that conduct the research. So please help us by filling out the form as, complete, as completely as, as uh, you feel uh, you can. So we've engaged in some listening sessions with underrepresented groups. Uh, we've started that work, but uh, obviously it needs to be in place and to continue as we uh, go about doing our work. Uh, the first thing we did was we started um, by leveraging the uh, liaisons that we have at, uh, at education for the White House initiatives uh, to uh, various groups. So um, there we, we um, spoke with the HBCU community at a conference that they had, and then uh, we've engaged White House initiative uh, listening sessions um, with um, uh, Hispanic voices, Black voices, Native American and Alaskan voices, uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander voices. Um, they don't have a um, White House initiative uh, for um, uh, individuals with disabilities. Um, so um, we need to uh, plan on how best to do this, um, uh, to have listening sessions. And I am assuming they're going to be multiple given the diversity of, uh, of uh, disability. Um, so um, uh, if you have any ideas about, uh, you know, who we should be talking to, let us know. We're, we're going to be starting this, um, the work for, with the uh, disability uh, listening sessions uh, in January. Here's a slide that shows where you could find where we have the updates to the commissioner blogs for um, uh, updating you on um, DEIA uh, progress and uh, where we will continue to do that. We also um, have done a blog series highlighting the work of a diverse group of IES funded researchers and fellows. Um, and you can find that at the link that is uh, embedded here. Um, and again, these slides will go up on the, um, the site for the PI meeting and uh, I will put them up on Nixer's webpage. Okay, speaking of blogs, um, before we go any further, I just want you to know uh, that we are open to PIs as guest blog writers. Um, if you don't want to be an author of a blog, but you have something that you would like shared, um, either findings or other aspects of the research that you've been doing, we'd be happy to help you do that either by, you know, doing a, a, a interview format uh, for the work or um, just writing about it ourselves, getting information from you and writing about it ourselves. Um, if, uh, if you're interested in this, please reach out to your program officer. Uh, we're always looking for um, uh, work about our research grants to, uh, to share with the world. Okay, um, so I'm gonna uh, spend a little bit of time talking about uh, peer review. There have been some changes for reviewing uh, the uh, special education and early intervention grants, and I, um, I, I, I realized sort of mid-year that that uh, you folks weren't um, necessarily in tune with that, especially if you don't serve on panels. So I thought I would uh, uh, talk a little bit about it. I've gotten the slide from um, Ann Ricciuti in the Standards and Review Office. It's more dense than my slides, but I kept everything on there and I didn't minimize it. So you can go back and you can you can uh, read what I'm going to talk about uh, more carefully um, if you so desire. So although funding rates for NICSER and uh, NCER are very similar, uh, there were concerns about whether the peer review strategy worked well for NICSER applications in all topic areas and whether um, our special education panel was optimally structured. So um, based on um, feedback based on observations in the, in the panel and feedback from applicants and reviewers, um, as well as conversations within IES, uh, we wanted to um, think about uh, percent, potential changes that can improve the process. So the change that has been, um, one, one of the changes that's been made is the special education panel was restructured so that now there are three more narrowly focused sections one on curriculum instruction, one that deals with behavioral and social um, and mental health uh, applications and another on transition. And the STEM work goes to uh, curriculum instruction and probably uh, the most uh, discussion we've had 
uh, over the past few years has been in the math panel. So uh, this is a, a obviously appropriate uh, response. So for other topic areas, the Office of Science is continuing to assign NICSER applications focused on students with or at, at, or at risk for high instance disabilities to substantive standing panels, much like they did before. But the, a new strategy is to group them together at, in one section of the panel so that they'll combine the um, NICSER uh, applications. So in these panels, there's a balance between the special education um, and reviewer, special education apps and reviewers um, and NICSER applications and, and, excuse me, and NCER application and reviewers, um, which allows um, IES to bring together expertise in these substantive areas. And um, they, have a, um, they have a track record of, of working really well together. And I, I think, for example, of the early intervention uh, panel that, that uh, uh, does so well um, working across both research centers. Um, so uh, these changes were tried in 2020 as well as 2021. And so the Standards and Review Office is now um, trying to assess how well this has worked and what other changes might be considered. So stay tuned, but, uh, but they're really trying to be responsive to uh, the, the um, feedback that uh, we've been getting from you uh, as reviewers and, and as applicants. Ann Ricciuti has a session on peer review during the PI meeting. It's Wednesday, January 26th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. So um, she'll cover this as well and certainly will be open to questions if you have them. So the next two slides I'm not gonna talk about, but I want to present them to you. They're the funding rates um, for um, NICSER and NCER that I, I provided both. Um, so uh, they, um, uh, cover from 2008 to uh, 2021. And again, I'll put this presentation on our homepage as well as it will be available through the, the uh, um, location for the uh, PI meeting. Um, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, public access. There has been a federal agency wide push for public access for a number of years. And I thought I would end my slides with some updates on how we are doing. Um, each of us has a role in ensuring that what we are learning isn't sitting um, behind a paywall or in a file cabinet, and, um, and we've been trying to uh, get this up and running for a number of years now. So first, uh, the publication side. Since 2013, just over 900 articles have been submitted to ERIC, and uh, the full text of these uh, articles is somewhat less, over 1,600 in part uh, reflecting the 12 month embargo period that many journals still require. Um, if you aren't sure if you have um, submitted your peer reviewed publications to ERIC as required by the terms and conditions of your grant award, you can type your grant number into the ERIC search engine to check. Um, and given that we have now instituted a policy to check compliance for our public access policy, before issuing new awards, this is probably a good time to check and see if your publications are in error. So beginning in 2015, all grants de uh, designed to test the causal impact of an intervention are required to share their research data. Um, and IES has also extended this requirement to other grants as well. Um, obviously, uh, in your applications, you were required to address this. Um, so uh, with publications of uh, findings now beginning, um, IES is assessing grantee compliance, much as we have been for the uh, uh, publications. So uh, 248 IES grantees have data management plans, and 55 projects have uh, completed data collection. And we're asking those who have completed their data collection and have their data ma uh, management plans um, uh, uh, completed to use the data source uh, field. The, there's a field called data source in ERIC to share where the data supporting your published findings are located so that the publication and the data that supports that publication can be seen together. Okay, that does it for the pre recorded me. Uh, thanks for your attention. And as I, I said, I'll make these slides available. Now let's transition to the live me and I can provide updates and answer, hopefully answer any questions um, uh, that you have. Thanks again, bye. 
So uh, thanks for putting up with that video. I have a feeling, I, I'm glad I went now as opposed to Thursday afternoon, because uh, I, I can tell this is gonna be gonna be tough. Um, I wanted to start off with a few updates as I promised. Um, I, I think the, probably one of the most important things is how's your budget, Joan? Um, and we have no news as of today about our, um, our budget for FY22. We're still operating under a continuing resolution. Um, and that goes through February 18th. Um, there's always a possibility that they will get an appropriation in that time, uh, but there is just as much a possibility at this point um, that uh, they will have another continuing resolution. So uh, stay tuned and uh, send good vibes to uh, Capitol Hill. Um, I also wanted to give you an update on the ARP initiatives that are ongoing. Um, so uh, in the Accelerating Pandemic Recovery Competition 324X, we have made two awards under the first deadline. And um, I have not seen the news flash from us on that, but it should be coming soon. And Amy, you can nod that it'll be coming soon. Yeah, good, okay. Um, and then projects from the second deadline, as you know, they're under review. And as I said in the uh, recorded portion, they will, uh, the panels will be uh, end of February and early March. The AI Institute we are funding in collaboration with NSF is underway and the prospectuses are under review. So that's also going, going along. Um, and um, we're actively working towards uh, both the middle school science and math challenges uh, that uh, I introduced in the recorded segment uh, and Mark introduced in a blog. And we anticipate a spring launch and um, implementation of the fall of this year. Now in the recorded session, I, instead of saying middle school science, I said middle school, um, I said math science, which is I guess a new prize that I'm developing on my own, but it's middle school science, science and elementary math. Okay. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about, I talked about the uh, project that's going on. Uh, we call it the 20 year project, which is looking, Beth Tipton and Larry Hedges are looking at RCTs from early on uh, through now and to see what we have learned. And um, uh, the uh, response rate has not been uh, the most stellar that it could be. Um, and maybe their email to you, if you have done an RCT with us is lost in spam. Um, but as I said in the, my recorded video, I'm worried about the response rate from uh, Nixer because we, um, you know, we 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 are one quarter of the split of the sample. So um, program offices will be reaching out to those of you who haven't responded. Uh, so please look at their email and try to to up our response rates on that because I really do think it'll be interesting. What do we learn from all these RCTs? What what, um, what have we contributed to the field in terms of capacity and, and uh, methodology, et cetera? Okay, um, and uh, uh, so why don't we get to questions? Britta is gonna help um, uh, let me know what the questions are. And you can either um, raise your hand or um, just put it in the chat and Britta will read it to me. If you raise your hand, uh, Katie will, will uh, help me uh, decide who's who. All right, so the first one, um, Joan was asking about all the resources um, and can you provide direct links um, following your presentation? Yeah, so I put the direct links in the uh, PowerPoint itself and that'll get up, uploaded onto the site and I will uh, put it on our um, landing page at Nix or two. So you can just go there and, and open it up and get the resources. Uh, the next question asks about for FY 2023 competition, will investigators have an opportunity to resubmit FY 2021 proposals complete with response to reviewers um, that they were unable to resubmit for FY 2022? Okay, so two parts to this question. The first one is that you're assuming we will have an FY 23 competition. So, you know, we, I can't guarantee anything until we see what our appropriation is. Um, but um, I am hopeful that we will. So, um, uh, you know, let's uh, uh, saying that and putting a caveat in place, you know, Congress has to be um, mindful of our need. 
um, then uh, yes, of course, your FY21 applications can be resubmitted if they weren't accepted in the um, round in FY21. Okay, we have a question here about transition. It says, when you refer to the new panels and one being on transition, will this include um, transitions of all kinds and all ages, such as starting EI post-hospital discharge um, and EI to school, school to adulthood, et cetera? Um, no, and I should have been clearer in, the, um, in, in my recorded talk. It'll be the transition from high school to uh, the next stage in life, uh, post-secondary employment, independent living. Um, and the reason for that is because, for example, um, the early intervention, early childhood panel, they're, they're pretty good um, with um, those issues. And um, I think it's appropriate to keep what's working, working. So we haven't seen the need for um, changing all of transition, just the, the projects that are focused on high schoolers. Uh, the next question says, what type of funding decision is needed to allow IES Nixer to make announcements for RFPs? So um, right now under continuing resolution, um, what, um, what we have to spend is what we had to spend uh, in the last fiscal year. And um, and there's only a certain amount of it that you can spend under a continuing resolution. So um, uh, we're hoping for two things. One is that we get the appropriation soon so that we can see how much money we have overall and decide how it's going to be broken up. What can we compete? Um, you know, the, the uh, two things have been my priority um, and, and um, one is to have our A competition funded, 324A. And the reason for that is because it does cover everything that um, we're mandated to do. And so we wanna make sure that we meet our mandate and, and leave this open. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't um, like systematic replication, you know, that, that calls for causal impact studies and A, you know, gives us a variety of things. So that, that's always been a priority for me. Um, and then the other is um, our research training, because I think it's really important that we keep those, those going. And, and uh, so um, uh, I think those would be the first thing, you know, Mark Schneider can tell me no way, but I, I don't, I think he would be fine with those as a priority. Um, and then we don't know if we will get a, a bump in our um, appropriation. Um, I have held out hope and there has been a little bit of movement on, in the Senate that suggests that we might get that bump. And if so, then um, uh, you know we can we can do more things and um, uh, have a deeper dive into some of the things we already do. The next question deals with um, the Recovery Act grants that we're in the process of. So we've already funded two, as you said, in round one. Um, how many awards are expected in round two? So um, we are going to fund until the money um, that we have been allotted runs out. And it's, it's, a, it's a nice chunk of the 100 million. Um, and I don't wanna say exactly what it is because I think that it might be flexible and I don't wanna announce that because if somebody, if some other center doesn't spend their money, I think Mark Schneider would be amenable uh, for us to spend it on in special ed. Um, he has been um, very um, thoughtful about trying to figure out ways to um, increase our ability to fund our work, um, and he's tried uh, to to <laughs> he's tried to do a lot of things and stay within the law. Um, so, uh, um, but so I, I'm I'm hopeful that if some uh, other center doesn't spend money on whatever they're planning that the um, the uh, uh, money can be fungible and be brought into to, um, IES. But we have a nice chunk of money uh, still to spend. And uh, um, so, you know, we're hoping to continue to get some good work out of it. Uh, 
This one talks about open science journals. It says open science journals provide another means of sharing fun, uh, findings publicly. Can grant funds be used to pay publishing fees in open science journals? Yes, the answer is yes. We really uh, want to support that kind of work. So that that uh, can be put into the uh, budget for your, your, um, your grants. We've run out of questions at this point, Joan. Okay. We don't have any hands, but don't be shy. It's under, I don't know, you all are probably more um, frequent Zoom users, but under reactions, you can raise your hand if you want to ask your question. Well, I, I, I've told people that uh, I don't get as many questions as one might, um, and that's either because I've answered everything in the recorded session and done a great job of it, or that I have numbed your minds so much that you can't think of any questions. And the jury's still out about which which it is. <laughs> well, Sharon, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Um, yes, thank you uh, so much for providing this update and for answering questions. It's it's always so bold to take questions from the field. Um, thank you for doing it. Um, are you able to say anything about the four proposals that in um, I guess it was 2020 um uh met uh criteria but were there were in, there were inadequate funds to fund them yes that uh, uh they go on every to-do list i've written since we had the slate funded uh is to just assess where we are with those uh four um i can't do anything formally until we get our appropriation um but i i just as of yesterday i had someone update um, some um, our budgets just to see, um, just to be ready for when we do get an appropriation to to uh, to be able to make a determination. Um, the the uh, the weird thing that's been happening, uh, it's 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 been a very different kind of year because you know we we were um, COVID hit, and so people were asking for supplements. At the same time, um, people were putting uh, their grants on pause or slowing down funding. And so it's just been a very dynamic situation um, as to how much money uh, we, we have had. Um, so, uh, so we're kind of trying to keep tabs on it. Um, my, my personal preference is that we, um, we fund those four grants because um, why would we make them resubmit and have to go through that process again and have to get peer reviewers to review it? Uh, but there will be, you know, a, 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 there'll be a, a a group involved in making this decision, and I'm sure that they may have uh, alternative um, points of view that uh, might uh, might have to win the day. And Stephanie, I saw that you had your hand up. Did you have a question that you wanted to ask or? It wasn't really a question. I just wanted to express appreciation um, for all that IES has done in helping us think about how to problem solve and just looking at all the faces here, wishing that we were together in person. So I just wanted to express appreciation for everyone and the efforts that everybody's trying to continue to help teachers and to help kids in schools. Thank you. And um, Stephanie, uh, I, I don't know if you were able to listen to the the um, the secretary's comments, but uh, that part where he was thanking people uh, for making their resources available. Um, you, you and um, Jill had done work at the very beginning of the pandemic, and I had specifically given him that information. Um, he didn't go to that level of detail, but I wanted to say it on the other side too, that we are very grateful for all you did. We did have another question come up in the chat, um, Joan. They're asking for updates on um, the post-sec uh, technical working group. All right, I see that. Hey, Meg. Um, so, um, we uh, had a post-secondary technical working group in December, and um, uh, the way that we um, the way that we have uh, 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 we we have our contractor who comes in and has someone take notes, and then they write up the the summary, and then they give it to us. 
And then um, depending on the quality, you know, if it's very high quality, we're able to just do a few things and post it. Uh, but we have some work to do on this one. Um, and so Akila and uh, Jackie are working to, uh, to finalize that. And so, um, and what has to happen is that once it um, gets edited by us, then it goes out to the, the people that were on the post-secondary um, technical working group and Meg was one of them. So you should get that um, Meg to look at. And then once you've had a chance to give us comments, then we'll post it. Um, and, and yeah, I, I won't say anymore, but we, we are really looking to take some action on that post-secondary tweet as well. I can say it that way. And then there is one last question. Will there be an early career development and mentoring competition this year? Um, I'm hoping if we have funding, because that would be one of my priorities. I think that the, um, I think that the um, work that we get from early career grantees under this program is incredible. Um, I can look at the, um, the list of projects and what they've accomplished. And it's just been, you know, a, 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 it's been really tremendous. And I'm hoping that it is, I think it's a good program and it's growing, you know, to, for us to be able to fund seven, uh, this, this past um, competition, 21 was, was great. That was our highest and um, love to be able to keep that going. They have no problem spending money. I had it. <laughs> Anyone else have any announcements or issues or anything that they want to raise to the group? All right, I just I want to say one more thing. Um, uh, for those of you who have been um, uh, grantees for a while, you know that at the end of uh, 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 this PI meeting talk, I love to have everyone cheer very loudly for special education. Um, my, my, uh, my thinking on that is uh, that it just makes the folks in the room for NCER incredibly jealous of the fun they think with that we've had and uh, the community of, of special education researchers, Hooten and Howland in the next room and the rest of the PI meeting, I always get questions is what, what is going on in there? So um, uh, I'd love to, for you all to give a cheer for special education. Now wait, um, unless you're gonna wake up your four-year-old or freak out your partner, you know, you can do it live. Um, if you can't, I'd like you to do it in your heart. Um, and I'd like you to um, I'd like you to cheer for um, all the hard work that this uh, has involved. I'd like you to cheer uh, for us getting through the last couple of years together in one place and um, hopefully still smiling. Um, I'd like you to cheer um, to support all of us who are in there, and I'd like to cheer you to cheer for what we are trying to accomplish through special education research. So in whatever way you can, uh, please uh, cheer special education research. And um, I hope to see many of you um, uh, in the next year um, at ASAP and take care of yourselves. Okay.